Hello and welcome. My name is Lori Green, President and Program Director at Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute. Gulf Coast Ultrasound, in collaboration with the American College of Emergency Physicians, is pleased to offer this presentation entitled, Benefits of an Ultrasound Program in Your Emergency Department. Our speaker today is Dr. Charlotte Durr. Dr. Durr is the Ultrasound Director and Ultrasound Fellowship Director at the University of South Florida Emergency Medicine Residency Program. She is also the Associate Program Director for the Residency Program. Dr. Durr is a Fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians and is a registered diagnostic medical sonographer. She has lectured extensively throughout the United States and internationally on diagnostic ultrasound. She has also authored and co-authored numerous book chapters, articles, and other publications. We've had the pleasure of working with Dr. Durr for many years, and I'm sure you're going to enjoy this presentation. Thank you, Lori, for the very kind introduction. Today during this program, we're going to discuss the benefits of an emergency ultrasound program in your emergency department. We're going to hit some highlights with some case examples as far as how emergency ultrasound can truly improve patient care. The first emergency medicine ultrasound curriculum was published in 1994, and in 2001, ASEP approved the first guidelines for the use of ultrasound in emergency medicine. Since that time, focused ultrasonography provided by emergency physicians has really become the standard of care for timely and accurate evaluation and treatment of emergency department patients. It has become widespread in both community and academic hospitals, as well as by medical personnel in pre-hospital systems. Since 2003, the ACGME has required that emergency medicine residency programs provide ultrasound training to their residents. A lot of research has been done to actually look at how point-of-care ultrasound improves patient care. And there are several studies available that actually show improved patient care with the use at the bedside in our emergency departments. It is shown to have increased diagnostic accuracy, shortened time to definitive therapy, and decreased complications from blind procedures. It's also been shown to provide improved patient satisfaction. There have been studies that show improved time to diagnosis, decreased length of stay, improved perception of the provider's competence, and increased confidence in the provider's ability to make a correct diagnosis. There's several clinical indications that are available in an ASEP policy statement and emergency ultrasound guidelines for the use of bedside ultrasound in our emergency departments. The first is related to our ability to use ultrasound rapidly and the ability to acutely resuscitate the most unstable patients. It can be used to provide diagnostic imaging capacity to take a patient who presents with a broad symptom or sign, such as shortness of breath, and it allows us to march down a clinical pathway to help us eliminate possible diagnoses off of our differential diagnosis list. It's commonly used for procedural guidance, for example, for vascular access. And in those patients that we've already administered therapy, it allows us to go back and provide monitoring to see how those patients are responding to our treatment in the emergency department. There are several core applications for which a majority of emergency departments provide core privileging in emergency ultrasound. And that's for applications relative to trauma, the ability to identify intrauterine pregnancies, assessment for an abdominal aortic aneurysm, various cardiac applications, evaluation of the biliary and urinary tracts, evaluation for deep venous thrombosis, various soft tissue and musculoskeletal applications, thoracic applications, the ability to use ultrasound to identify different ocular pathologies, and for procedural guidance. There are also extended applications for emergency ultrasound, such as advanced echo techniques, transesophageal echo, the ability to use ultrasound at the bedside to rapidly identify problems with bowel, adnexal pathologies, testicular abnormalities, and it's used for transcranial Doppler and contrast studies. I'd like to go ahead and give you some examples of how ultrasound at the bedside has improved patient care, beginning with increased diagnostic accuracy. The next patient you see is a 55-year-old male who's involved in a motor vehicle accident, and he comes in complaining of right rib pain and reports that it's worse with deep inspiration. He has been transferred from another hospital where he had an evaluation that resulted in a renal hematoma being found on CAT scan. His workup at the outside facility included chest x-ray, pelvis x-ray, a CT of the head and cervical spine, and a CT of the abdomen and pelvis. You go ahead and review the chest x-ray from the outside facility. And you notice perhaps a little bit of small hemothorax on the left side of the chest, 
but no evidence of any pneumothorax in the chest x-ray. You recall reading a recent article that said that the sensitivity for ultrasound is actually much better than that of chest x-ray for the identification of pneumothorax. So you proceed to go ahead and grab your ultrasound machine and approach the patient to perform a bedside ultrasound examination to help better determine why the patient may be having the rib pain and pain with deep inspiration. With your high frequency linear array transducer placed over the patient's right anterior chest wall about the third or fourth intercostal space, you notice on your ultrasound, first at the top in the near field, soft tissue, musculoskeletal chest wall, two ribs, and a bright pleural line connecting just deep to the ribs. You notice in looking at the pleural line that it doesn't appear to be much movement. Now there's movement of the line in regards to the patient and his ability to take inspiration for you. There's no pleural sliding that you would see with a normal lung. Astutely, you go ahead and take a look at the patient's normal side for a comparison. On the left side of the screen, what we have is the patient's right lung where he has the complaints of rib pain and pain with deep inspiration. On the other side of the screen, we have the patient's left lung, which is the normal side. In comparing the two, you can see in the normal lung, the bright pleural line sliding back and forth as the patient takes deep inspiration in and out. In addition to pleural sliding, you see what are called comet tail artifacts, which are these bee lines. These bright white areas look like comet tails coming from the pleural line. That's evidence of a normal lung. In a patient with a pneumothorax, you lose the sliding motion and you lose the presence of comet tail artifacts. In his abnormal lung, there's no pleural sliding and no bright B lines, no comet tail artifacts. So this is a patient that has an occult pneumothorax that was missed by the chest x-ray, but found on bedside ultrasound. So ultrasound is more sensitive than chest x-ray in the evaluation of a pneumothorax. It can greatly assist you in your ability to make a correct diagnosis. So not only can it increase your diagnostic accuracy as we saw in the previous example, ultrasound can shorten the time to definitive therapy, particularly in your most critical patients. This patient is a 45-year-old who comes in after a syncopal episode. He had recently been discharged from the hospital where he had reports of chest pain. He was being transported home when the person driving the vehicle noticed that the patient had reported chest pain and then slumped over. They rapidly returned to the hospital and as you're sitting in your pod in your emergency department hearing a presentation from a resident, you see a nursing staff member pushing a wheelchair with a slumped over patient quickly into your resuscitation area. So jumping up from your seat with a resident, you walk in to find a patient who is in obvious respiratory distress, who is hypotensive with a heart rate of 115, respiratory rate of 24, and at this point you don't have the patient's O2 sats. Now at this point, your resident is salivating because they're anticipating the ability to go ahead and intubate this patient to help establish an airway. Meanwhile, your junior resident grabs an ultrasound machine to help aggressively work up this unstable patient. Now with the patient recently being discharged from the hospital with complaints of shortness of breath, chest pain, and a syncopal episode, number one on my differential list was the possibility that this patient has a pulmonary embolism. But how with my unstable patient am I going to get him to CAT scan to help confirm that diagnosis? In evaluating the patient with our bedside ultrasound, we were most concerned about the right ventricle and its size relative to the left. Patients that have acute right heart strain will have a dilated right ventricle as compared to the left, where normally we expect the right ventricle to be about two-thirds the size of the left. This patient also with color flow had evidence of tricuspid regurgitation. And if you visualize this patient's septum in this region, you note that it's bowing towards the left ventricle. Now, this ultrasound was done by one of my interns who had just taken an introductory ultrasound course. And she did a pretty good job. And this was, she was immediately available to apply the skills that she had just learned rapidly at the bedside to make a very important diagnosis in a patient who is too unstable to go to CAT scan. So with right-sided heart strain, bowing of the right ventricle in the septum to the left side and the presence of tricuspid regurgitation, we knew that the patient had a pulmonary embolism. We started to aggressively treat that patient right away in the emergency department. We were able to obtain rapid improvement in this patient, and we were able to go ahead and repeat the ultrasound within about 30 minutes. And here's our repeat ultrasound, and it showed much less right heart strain in response to our therapeutic measures 
and it was just fantastic to be able to go repeat the scan, see definitive signs of improvement. This patient's vital signs sta stabilized, and he was able to go over to CAT scan, where we were able to confirm the presence of a pulmonary embolism. So without having the bedside ultrasound, I suspected that the patient had PE, but would I have been as aggressive in my measures in treating this patient had I not been able to confirm my suspected diagnosis with my ultrasound? Probably not. I would have felt a lot more comfortable knowing for sure there was a PE rather than just guessing blindly that the patient had a pulmonary embolism and starting the appropriate treatment. So the ability to confirm that, that diagnosis, I felt very comfortable with the aggressive measures that I was able to take in treating this patient he improved dramatically in a more rapid fashion than had I not had ultrasound, and he was able to avoid intubation, his, uh, his vital signs uh, normalized, as I mentioned before, and he was ad admitted to the hospital in more stable condition, where he continued to improve and had more definitive therapy. Ultrasound has also been shown to decrease complications from blind, blind procedures. My patient, who was 75 years old, who came with altered mental status and fever, she was found to be hypotensive with a fast heart rate and to be febrile. She had a history of urosepsis, and this was a patient who I suspected probably had another episode of sepsis, and she was not responding to my aggressive fluid management. The patient was going to need pressors, and she was also going to need central venous access. In my approach to the patient, I wanted to make sure that I was able to obtain a central line the safest way possible. And the way to do that was to use ultrasound for my procedural guidance. When I took a look at the patient's right internal jugular vein area, just to pre-scan to make sure it was safe to go in the area, this is what I found. Now just to get you oriented, here's the skin, soft tissue, muscle layer, thyroid, and this here is the carotid artery, and this is the internal jugular vein. So this patient actually had reversed anatomy. Now, if I had done this procedure blind, I would have stuck the carotid artery in this patient and would have had, therefore, a complication related to bleeding. So by using ultrasound, I avoided the puncture of the carotid artery, and I was able to choose an alternative location and actually visualize with live guidance the placement of the needle precisely into the internal jugular vein, avoiding complications such as carotid artery puncture, such as pneumothorax, Ultrasound will actually guide you so that you know where your needle tip is at all times to make the procedure the safest possible for your patients. I had another patient who came in who also needed a central line. And in pre-scanning the patient in the area of his internal jugular vein, I found this. So just to orient you here in our video clip, here's the IJ. Here's the carotid. This patient actually has thrombosis within his internal jugular vein here in the long axis from a prior central venous catheter. So I think, well, I can't go on that side, better to go the other. He actually had bilateral IJ thromboses. We had to cho choose an alternative site for this patient. So I was very thankful that I had used bedside ultrasound and not done a blinded technique for central venous access in this individual. So you're enthusiastic about ultrasound and you're eager to get started in your emergency department. So how do you start scanning? Well, the first thing you need to do is approach your credentialing committee and find out through the hospital bylaws whether or not there are current clinical ultrasound privileges available in your department. They may not exist, and you may be need to be the one that gets the ball rolling. It could be that somebody ahead of you, such as your department chair or another member of your department, has gone ahead to establish some guidelines for, for credentialing and privileging. And you'll just need to go ahead and obtain a copy of those guidelines so you can begin your training and follow the credentialing guidelines to obtain those privileges. Oftentimes, departments follow our ASEP guidelines or some modification thereof, and those are available on the American College of Emergency Physicians website. You'll need to select an ultrasound coordinator, somebody to lead the charge of ultrasound through the emergency department, and decide amongst your colleagues and with the ultrasound coordinator what the scope of practice is going to be for bedside ultrasound in your department. Once you have an ultrasound machine, the next step is to make sure that you get all your emergency department staff appropriately credentialed, and that begins with training. Training is usually the biggest hurdle. To get everybody on board, to get the proper training done, and to have a good way of reviewing images that is a good way of documenting what you've done and what the results were and how they compared to other studies that are done, what they may call formal studies or complete studies done up in radiology. 
to compare to your own imaging findings. Because you'll want to have documentation of these things. Some places use pen and paper. They print out thermal images. They didn't take copies of the radiology reports and staple them together. And they keep a notebook. Other places are much more technologically savvy and have wireless capability where the images are sent to uh, a data system of some sort, whether that be PACS or a cloud-based technology that allows for more aggressive image review. But either way, you'll need to keep track of the number of exams that you have done in their confirmatory studies so that you can prove that you have the proper credentialing in line to go ahead and obtain privileges for bedside ultrasound. That ultrasound coordinator will need to set up a QA and risk management program. It's important to make sure that physicians are reassessed frequently to make sure that their skills in ultrasound are not substandard and that they're staying within their scope of practice in regards to the practicing of emergency ultrasound in, in your department. And finally, continuing medical education in regards to ultrasound is another important aspect of setting up an ultrasound program. It means that your ultrasound director is recommended to have 10 hours of CME specifically in ultrasound every two years, according to the ASAP guidelines, and that your other credentialed providers have at least five hours of ultrasound CME every two years. So what are your options for training? Well, you can attend an off-site ultrasound course in emergency medicine ultrasound applications. You can have a course brought to you at your site, which can be custom made and tailored to your needs. Once you have training, it's important to find that person that's going to do the image review and skills assessment for you. So it has to be another credentialed emergency physician that can overread your images to make sure that you're doing a good job and that your skills are developing appropriately and that you're ready for credentialing purposes. Or you may choose a physician that's credentialed in emergency ultrasound that is outside your facility where you can send them uh, HIPAA protected images that is de-identified scans for them to review in concert with your confirmatory studies. So the resources that exist to help you with your ultrasound training and in getting the other physicians in your department also trained. Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute and American College of Emergency Physicians are two excellent resources. Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute has regularly scheduled emergency department courses that are led by nationally recognized faculty. They also have over 21 courses in various subject including emergency medicine and other advanced applications. They conduct on-site emergency department courses where they come to your facility to custom make a curriculum that fits the needs of your physicians. There are several online emergency department courses available, DVDs, on-demand webinars that cover a variety of ultrasound topics that are applicable to emergency medicine. There's hot tips videos where you can learn the tricks of the trade from ultrasound experts, an electronic newsletter, and even a Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute blog. The American College of Emergency Physicians also has several available resources on their website. There are white papers on how to set up an ultrasound presence in your emergency department and even how to approach your medical director with an ultrasound proposal. There are credentialing and pri privileging guidelines for emergency ultrasound and standards for how to report the exams that you perform in the emergency department. There's a, a thorough white paper with full detail about emergency ultrasound guidelines and training, the ideal ultrasound machine and its features for your emergency department, an ultrasound image criteria compendium so you know exactly what to show and what to document with your images and findings, and emergency ultrasound coding and reimbursement. Finally, ASAP offers a listing of emergency ultrasound preceptorships and a data bank of ultrasound images, case studies, and video case studies to help continue your education in emergency ultrasound.